a terrifying siege at a synagogue at Coleyville in Texas. When the gunman first turned up at the door, the rabbi had offered him tea. Making tea was an opportunity for me to talk with him. And in that moment, I didn't hear uh, anything suspicious. It was later during prayer when the rabbi turned towards Jerusalem that he heard the click of a gun. Four hostages were held for around 10 hours before they managed to escape. I told them to go. I threw a chair at the gunman and I headed for the door. And all three of us were able to get out without even a shot being fired. This was the moment they ran for their lives. FBI negotiators had noticed the gunman spoke with an English accent and he used British slang, referring to the police as coppers. He was quickly identified as a 44-year-old from Blackburn, Malik Faisal Akram. His family told Channel 4 News he'd been suffering with mental health issues. Just how did he manage to organise his travel from this northern mill town to America to carry out his attack? I think that's one of the strange uh, anomalies of, of, of this story is that um, if, if he was known to the authorities and of his previous records, how he was allowed to get into um, America in the first place. Just four months ago, Akram had been mourning the loss of his brother, who had died from Covid. He was well known on these streets, he had a criminal record for low-level offences, and he'd been given an ASBO for causing a nuisance at the magistrate's court. But we've also been told he was reported to the police over concerns about his extremist views. We've been speaking to those who knew Akram here in this town. They say that his mental health had progressively deteriorated, particularly following a divorce. But were there also signs of radicalisation? I've spoken to two business owners who say that Akram threatened them with a knife. One because he was selling alcohol in his shop. The other because the businessman had taken out a loan and was repaying interest, which is considered haram or forbidden in Islam. Do you think the community should have been concerned about his possible radicalisation? Because, you know, he was threatening shopkeepers that were selling alcohol, for example. I would suggest uh, somebody contemplating those sort of activities would have issues with mental health. But do you think it should have been picked up earlier then? Maybe someone should have worried about radicalisation? Uh, perhaps. I think maybe the authorities needed to look at it, but certainly not the community. If this was any other individual uh, and he had a, a background of medical, uh, mental health issues, that that would be the first thing that you, we, we would discuss and not talk about uh, necessarily about things like radicalisation. The service at the synagogue had been live streamed. Akram's voice was heard demanding the release of this woman, Afia Siddiqui, a Pakistani neuroscientist, convicted in 2010 of trying to murder American soldiers. She's serving an 86-year sentence in a prison near the synagogue, a sentence some believe to be unjust. This was an act of terror. This was an act of terror. And it not only was uh, related to someone who had been arrested, I might add, 15 years ago and been in jail for 10 years. The idea is it was something new. What happened in Texas is being investigated as an anti-Semitic act of terror. But in Akram's hometown, his family told me he was disorderly, disorganized, never a planner. They're asking how a man with obvious mental health issues managed to travel abroad and whether he was given any assistance. Akram's family say they had no idea he was in America until Saturday when they received a message saying he wanted to speak to them one last time. They've spoken of their shock and horror at what happened, but they've also questioned why officers had to shoot him dead in Texas after the hostages had escaped. FBI negotiators described him during the siege as being emotionally unstable and on the live feed you could hear him extremely agitated. He was often repeating himself. His family say that in the past he had spoken of wanting to die. They say that he had referred to not just global issues such as the imprisonment of Muslims, but also things closer to home which had been agitated, which had been agitating him. For example, he was extremely distressed when his house was repossessed following his divorce. Now, investigators will be looking at all of these issues. They'll be looking at his previous contact with the police, not just for issues of criminality, but as I was reporting just then, about any previous concerns that may have been reported about his extremist views. They'll also be asking about whether he ever sought help for his mental health issues and, importantly, whether he ever received that help.